You're listening to episode 198 of the Master Your Mind, Business, and Life podcast. Stories are a fundamental part of life, and today's guest is on a mission to help women share their stories with the world. Emily Barras is the founder and CEO of Bold Story Press, a publishing house for women authors who want to share their stories with the world. Emily spent the first 32 years of her career in the publishing industry. As vice president and editor-in-chief at McGraw-Hill, she transformed the sluggish culture into a competitive, hungry, growth-driven business. Fueled by explosive creativity, her division quadrupled signings of new books with innovative content for the future. Emily and I have a beautiful conversation, and she provides some really great tips. But before you meet Emily... I want to give that reminder that this past Sunday, we launched a new series. That's right. You are now getting doses of Master Your Mind, Business, and Life on Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday. This new series is called Awaken Your Soul Sunday. It's a little bit different than my other episodes as this is a storytelling series that shares moments of awakening, trials and tribulations, truth and vulnerability in the words and voice of the featured storyteller. Awaken Your Soul Sunday focuses on sharing the moments in life that shaped you, shifted you, and provided you that big aha moment that you never knew you needed. This past Sunday, I launched an episode that is near and dear to my heart as my grandfather, who has worked alongside of presidents, celebrities, and pro athletes, as well as the everyday hardworking American, shares a story that shifted his life. Coming up on the series, we have a few voices that you may remember, like veteran NFL linebacker Arthur Motes, and even some new voices. If you would like to be part of this new series, I would love for you to share your story. Simply visit mindbizlife.com and then look for the Awaken Your Soul Sunday tab and follow the outline steps. Remember to subscribe to Master Your Mind, Business, and Life on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Podbean, or wherever it is that you tune in and turn it up so you don't miss an episode. Speaking of which, are you ready to meet Emily? You know what to do. (laughs) Tune in, turn it up, let's go. You're listening to Master Your Mind, Business and Life. Conversations with everyday world shifters, truth seekers, and rule breakers. Here's your host, Lauren Smith. Hi, Emily. Welcome to the show. I'm excited to have you join me today. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here, Lauren. Emily, you are the founder of Bold Story Press, a publishing house for women authors. I know your job description just probably had so many people's ears perk up in this moment because they're probably like, oh, I've thought about writing a book. But before we discuss all things publishing, I would love to learn a little bit more about you and your journey What led you to starting a publishing house? Well, it is kind of a a long route uh, story. I started out um, in a big Irish Catholic family in Wilmington, Delaware, where my mother was a librarian and we grew up loving books. The bookmobile used to stop in front of our house every week and we were allowed to get five books off the bookmobile truck. And my whole family has always um, loved reading and many of them writing. And so when I graduated from college, I um, immediately went to New York and and got a job, my first job in publishing where I started out as an editorial assistant. Um, Then I spent 32 years in the publishing industry working working my way up. Um, Some of that was in New York, some in Boston, some Chicago, and many years in Philadelphia. Um, And I left publishing um, several years ago. My last role was as editor-in-chief of a division of McGraw-Hill and left publishing to work for a nonprofit here in Washington, D.C., who worked work to help low-income high schools raise their college enrollment rates. Mm-hmm. Um, so I did that for a few years and then started a business called Bold in Business. I realized that too many young women starting out today and you know, five years into their careers were struggling with owning their power 
in the business world, um, letting go of that people pleasing behavior and the perfectionism so that they could take bold risks. And so mm -hmm. um, I worked for about four years in that area of empowering women. I, I did one-on-one um, -on -one coaching with entrepreneurs and taught a class uh, to a group of women every eight weeks on how to, to own their power. And I loved that work. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Oh, it really was. And I met the most amazing women um, on that part of the journey. I really loved it. So, but I missed publishing. I really, I wanted to get back to publishing. And so when I started thinking about what that would look like, I thought a lot about um, what I had learned in, in during the time I was teaching women about uh, empowerment. And, and I realized that in my 32 year career that um, I probably played a role in uh, perpetuating the, the male um, dominance really of, of uh, the publishing platforms. And, and, and I mean, my concern has grown to, to believe that, um, that if the world had a balance of women's voices and men's voices, that we would be in a much better place. Mm. And so thinking about that, I, I, I realized that um, most of the voices in media, both in social media and on, on television are, are still male voices. Um, eight of the 10 best-selling books are all written by men. Um, the majority of of um, writers and journalists on television and in print are still men. And so I realized that I wanted to start my own publishing house and I wanted to um, create a platform for women authors only in, in part because I wanted to um, um, increase the number of women's stories out there, but also also to try and maybe undo some of what I might've done in those 32 years without realizing that, that I may have had a bias toward, toward um, signing and promoting books written by men. That's really interesting that after such a long career, you were able to take that step back and just see what you were doing as part of your job. Like it, I'm sure it wasn't that consciousness of, hey, I'm doing this to promote men. It's very subconscious choice, right? But it's also driven by what we know and what we're told and, and what you have to do and deadlines and this is going to sell. So there's many factors that go into this, but to make the intentional choice now in this stage in life to kind of go back and maybe not do what you once did and to really put women's voices high up and make sure that they're heard. That is so amazing. So amazing. Thank you. Yeah. And I agree. I, I don't know about you, but I found in my experience, um, gaining confidence and, and, um, success in the business world that I learned most of what I needed to learn from other women. Mm, yes. I watched them and kind of modeled their behavior when I saw, um, when I found successful women that I wanted to be more like. And so the idea of putting more, women's stories out into the world and whether it's in in the business arena or whether it's in the parenting arena or or the politics arena um i just think in fact i'm confident that the world will be a better place um mm -hmm. when we when we have uh, more women's stories to teach us and guide us Oh, I absolutely agree. And, and I, I love that you, you focus on this too, of, of you're not really sure what you're missing with the story too, because you're right. There are so many times that there is not a woman's voice heard. I remember I, I was a young mom and um, I saw so many business women just rocking it. And a lot of them 
didn't have kids. So then I was comparing myself to, to women who didn't have kids who were crushing it. And I'm comparing my story to theirs, which is very oranges to apples at the time. And then when I finally found a business person who was also a young mom, it, I just used her as a model. I think she was maybe seven to 10 years older than me, but I was like, if she can do this, I can do this. And it's not that I didn't resonate with the other women who were crushing it, but I then almost had this, you know, new role model of she's a mom, she can, you know, juggle it all and she runs a business. I can do it too. So if it wasn't for her voice and her actual presence on social media, I'm not sure that I would have fully stepped into becoming my best self, my highest self. Wow. Good for you that you recognized that you needed to find someone who looked like you, who had a similar, you know, set of responsibilities and, and, and figured out how did she do it? Yeah. And and that's really hard too, without pulling that comparison too, because of course, with things like social media, you're only given a glimpse of someone's real life. I feel like when you take it into a book, there's a lot more vulnerability in the stories that can be shared. Yeah. You know, there's, um, I don't know if you ever suffer from perfectionism. Oh, yes. <laughs> so, so one of the things I learned um, not that long ago is that that is largely a female issue, mm. that men don't tend to suffer from perfectionism. And, you know, nothing will stop you faster from taking risks than, than feeling like anything that comes out of your mouth has to be perfect before you're allowed to say it. Yes. So it's a real, um, it can really hold women back. And it's another reason why we need lots of other female models showing us how to take risks and succeed, but also take risks and fail, just keep taking risks. You know? Just to take those risks. Yeah. And do you think that sometimes that suppression of voice is what holds people back from sharing a story, from writing a book? I know that that in itself, the, the vulnerability piece, but maybe also that story that they've been telling themselves or that society has told them to not take up space, that women should remain small, don't take up space. Do you think that those old programmings kind of sit within women and, you know, maybe detour them from writing their book? Absolutely. What a great point and question. Mm. Uh, there is this, um, um, I guess modesty is, is kind of the word, you know, this, there's this knee jerk response to praise and to the spotlight for so many women where we want to deflect it away from us. And because it's uncomfortable, it's uncomfortable when, you know, praise and compliments and, and all the attention is, is on us. And so, um, in business, too often women give the credit away. They'll say, oh, no, I got lucky or, oh, it was, you know, wasn't just me. It was the team. Instead of saying, thank you, I worked really hard on this. Yes, I did. I That was a great point because I don't even think that I was conscious of that, of saying, oh, it was a team effort. That comes up so many times. I think I've said that so many times when I know I did the brunt of the work. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with acknowledging a team. Of course you acknowledge a team, but do not give your credit away, Mm. you know, own it. Yes, absolutely. So as we're empowering women to share their stories, as women are coming to you at the publishing house, what are some of the struggles that you see with someone who may be coming with their first book? And is is there a good time to, to approach a publishing house? Like, do I need to have my entire book already thought out in my head? Do I need to have a couple chapters written? When do we really approach a publishing house? Yeah, I, I would recommend that you have um, a first draft, at least. If not, if not something pretty close to a final draft, um, because most publishing houses are not going to sign you when you are still writing and when the the story is still taking shape. Not not unless you're someone pretty famous or you're you're in the you know the national light for some reason. So so 
writing that first draft and getting the story um, down on paper and having a clear sense of what what you want to share with the world is is the time to start reaching out to publishers. Um, and then you want to write a, pr a prospectus, which which I actually think is a great exercise to start the process with a, pr a prospectus or a proposal basically is a one or two page summary where where you describe what the story is about and um, who the main competitors are, who the market is and who the readers are that will want to buy it. Thinking about those things in advance of writing is often a really useful way to make sure that you're talking to the right people when you're writing. Oh, that's a really interesting tip that I hadn't thought of because you can almost use that as your guide to make sure, oh, yep, I'm keeping in, in line with this and it's staying on base because I can imagine depending on the type of book that you're writing, you can kind of go down a few different rabbit holes and at the end you're like, oh, it's not where I thought I was going with this. Yeah, yeah. And and you asked about one of the, um, w what is one of the obstacles or challenges for women yeah, it's yeah the perfectionism thing like letting go and saying okay it's good enough I'm going to send it out now I'm going to send it to publishers and let them tell me if it's good or not good and if it's publishable it's it's some women will do all the work of writing for a year two years and get to the point where it's time to pull the trigger and send the manuscript in and they can't do it like they're they're paralyzed by um by worry that it's not good enough somehow mm. I really tried to drill in that purpose over perfect message mm. not just in the podcast but in my life because I am definitely that person who gets tripped up on perfectionism not just in my work I do it in my parenting style I do it with my self critique it comes in so many different areas that at some point you really just have to take a hands off approach and say am I really focusing on the perfectionism or am I going to learn into my lean into my purpose now and a lot of times that helps me decide okay it's in that enough phase. It's good enough right now because it's aligned with my purpose. Other times I'm like, no, it's nowhere near good enough, <laughs> you know, but it really helps you just kind of gauge it as, am I stuck in my perfectionism or am I really leaning towards my purpose? Because when you lean towards your purpose, you can kind of figure out that almost just about anything is good enough. Oh, that's wonderful. I love that. Oh, well, thank you. It was actually taught to me from one of my mentors. So I'm not going to steal the credit for it, but it's been very beneficial. And in the perfectionism really does. You're right. It trips you up. Yeah. 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 So, so many women don't realize that confidence is a skill. It's a skill that you can learn. It's not, you know, you're either born with it or not born with it. Um, mm -hmm. And, and one of the ways you build confidence is by building resilience. And one of the ways you build resilience is by um, taking risks. And it doesn't matter if you succeed or fail, just taking the risks. So taking action, just keep taking action, uh, builds your resilience skills. And that in turn builds your confidence skills. And, and that's what I was thinking of when you were just describing that metric that you use for yourself about purpose. Yes. You know, if you keep trying instead of, you know, stopping and worrying, just keep taking action, you become more confident. It becomes easier and easier. Mm, I love that. And yes, it's just like that confidence muscle, right? Like you just have to keep building that muscle up just like you would go to the gym on leg day. I mean, I, I skipped that the whole thing, but, <laughs> but if I were to go to a gym on leg day, it's sounding really good. I know, right? We, we can pretend. But I'm also really curious because I have been someone who has self-published before. So where does working with a publishing house outweigh self-publishing through say Amazon's Kindle direct publishing? Um, so there are so many, publishing has changed so much in the last 10 years, and we all know that, uh, but but when you look at all of the ways it has changed, it's just stunning. 
there are 4,000 books being published every day now. Whoa. <laughs> 4,000. And so most, the huge majority of those books are being uploaded onto the Kindle platform and they exist only as eBooks and, and the huge majority of them aren't very good to be perfectly honest. Yeah, um, yeah. Nobody else ever looks at them or edits them or gives feedback on them other than the author. And, and there's a lot of mediocre and bad writing, you know, available um, out there. And so you can, anybody can upload a book onto, um, onto the Kindle platform or any of the ebook platforms anytime they want. Um, the traditional publishers, the, the way we were set up was you paid an author a small advance, you incurred all the costs for editing, designing, producing, and publishing the book. And then when the book sold, you gave the author a 15% royalty. So you kept the majority of the, of the profit. Mm. Hybrid publishing, which is what Bold Story Press is, is um, a business model where we ask the author to share in the risk by paying for some of those charges up front. So there's um, some fees involved in, in editing and designing the book, but then the author keeps the majority of the royalties, 85% of the royalties, and we keep um, 15 to, to 20%. So, so those are the two of the possible models in, in publishing when working with publishing companies. With self-publishing, you can, of course, publish it yourself, but then you have to find a good editor and there are a million editors out there, but, but it's very difficult to find for, a good one <laughs> for a person to know if they're good right right how do you know right. and and in, then you have to find a good designer someone who understands how to do composition how to create you know an internal design that looks good and makes sense how to design the cover etc um, how to do the metadata research so that your book shows up in searches on amazon etc so there are lots of lots of um, important pieces to this process that will have a big impact on your success. And uh, I believe that most writers still need some help. If not the traditional publishing route, then, then certainly um, uh, a hybrid publishing route. Yeah, I think the hybrid sounds, I, to me, I think that sounds more appealing than the traditional. Um, mostly because I like the way that it still allows you to have a team in your corner mm -hmm. to accomplish the objective without like having to do, cause it, the, the traditional model being paid out front and like you're doing all the legwork and there's back and forth. It does feel very like old school, right? It's like, okay, we, we have a new way we can do this. <laughs> and, and I like this hybrid model of it. So I think that's a fascinating concept. And I can say self-publishing through Amazon, my goal was to not like be book famous, right? Like my, my initial intention of it was I just wanted to create something for the world and put it out there. So I knew what my intention was going out. Had my intention been different and I want to be a best-selling author, I would have gone through a publishing house. So my intention was different, but I can say I was confused as all get out going oh, through yeah. this process, not because it was very difficult, but because it's out of your wheelhouse. So it's yeah. not something that you're doing every day. So you don't realize all the steps you need. And I missed a critical step, which it was a very small, um, very, very small overlook. But my book, when I had published it a week later, someone had filed the trademark to the name. So then a couple, they had backdated it, of course, before, you know, terms of use that they had used it before the book was published. And then six months after I published the book, I had to take it down and, wow. and rename the entire book because I had a, um, what is it? The legal cease to whatever that is. I had, you know, their lawyer sent me it, had to take it down. And someone had told me, well, if you would have used the publishing house, like you could have had a lot more 
you know, support in your corner as to how to navigate this. Yeah. And I had never thought about that before. So there were just, I can say from my personal experience, and if you're thinking about starting a book, it, yeah, it could be easy self-publishing, but personally, I feel like I would go with someone like Emily doing the publishing house just for that experience. Like, otherwise you're going in with your eyes closed <laughs> and you're just like, okay, I'm just going to figure it out myself. And it's, it takes a lot more time and a lot more work. Yeah. Yeah. And time is money. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> and what do you value your time at? Right. So right. that's, that's really huge. Right. So what would you tell a woman who has always thought someday I'm going to write a book? Start today. <laughs> Start today. And find the smallest possible step you can take. And maybe that's writing a paragraph. Maybe that's writing just a sentence, um, but start writing now and try to write every day. If you're someone who suffers from you're not the boss of me, like I do, <laughs> <laughs> I have a terrible time with, I don't like other people telling me what to do, but sadly, I also don't like me telling me what to do. Yes, <laughs> I, I resonate with that, Emily. I feel you. <laughs> so I have all this resistance to doing, you know, when I set goals for myself. So if I break it down small enough, I can do it. And for me right now, I'm, I'm working on writing, uh, I'm writing a paragraph a day because that's what I can do right now. Mm. now. I like, yeah, I like that breaking it down because if you think a full book, that's daunting. That's, that's oh, yeah. like a, oh, a book. And then the, your perfectionism self comes in, right? And you're like, oh, I don't have the time for this. And then it's like excuse, excuse, excuse. But if you tell yourself a paragraph a day five sentences every day, a paragraph a week, whatever you can manage. I can see how you are able to achieve those goals then. And it's like that little, I don't know about you, but I'm a to-do list person. So sometimes just checking off that to-do list makes you feel really accomplished <laughs> for mm -hmm. the day. Mm -hmm. So just, I can imagine how writing one paragraph gives you that same amount of satisfaction. Right. Right. So what are you finding by writing one paragraph a day? How does that work with your writing style? So what often happens is I write more than a paragraph. Um, I'll get started and I have a clear story that, that I want to tell and I get caught up in it and I end up writing quite a bit more. But by just holding myself accountable to the one paragraph, I don't fight it as much. Mm, yeah, because I think it's like when you get in that role, right? And you're just like, now I can't stop. Now I start it and I can't stop. Yeah. Yeah. So, are there, are there ever days where you sit down to write and you just struggle? Absolutely. And one of the tricks I've learned when that happens is if in the worst case scenario, I will write five times. I can't think of what to write. 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 So I'll write my paragraph just saying that I don't know what to write. <laughs> Because I fulfilled my my uh, obligation to myself, right. yeah, and and I can move on. It Stephen King has a wonderful book out on. It's called On Writing, and in it he talks about how he trained himself. He trained his muse, right, his creative juices, to to show up and flow every morning when he sat down in his office at his desk, opened the computer and started writing. And, and the way he trained himself was just to keep doing it. So he mm -hmm. showed up every day, whether or not anything inspirational came to him and he wrote. And by doing that every day over time, his brain said, oh, okay, we're in the office, we're sitting down, the computer's open, it's time to write. Right. Um, so you can, you can train your even your creative parts to show up for work if you if you're consistent yes and i like that you can also just give yourself grace on the days where you may not be feeling the most creative or maybe only i have nothing to write today comes out five times right. um, because then you you've given yourself permission then to move on you have done what you said you were going to do 
okay, now we're going to move on for the day and not let that kind of stick with you for the rest of the day. Right, right. Oh, I love that word grace too. What a great choice of words there. Yeah, I think that that's a word that I also think that as women, we need to lean into a little bit more of giving ourselves more grace. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I agree. One thing that we do talk about a lot on the podcast is childhood. And you had mentioned that you grew up in a family full of readers. So I'm interested, kids today, how do you think parents can really nurture the love of reading for children? What a great question. Uh, You know, in my family, reading was synonymous with love. (laughs) And I know that my siblings and I all did that with our children. Um, I read to my son every night, you know, in his bed with my arm around him snuggling until he was old enough that he said, I want to read myself now, go away. Yeah. And, you know, for him, that was about, I don't know, first grade, maybe second grade. So, and I started Um, as soon as he was born it was really you know when he was an infant I every night would read a story to him so so that was the one time of day when he could always count on my full attention my you know hugging him and um, doing something together that we both loved and so I highly recommend that to parents. It is, it becomes, I I mean, you start out thinking that you're doing it for your child, but of course, what a huge gift it is for yourself. And it not only instills a love of reading in the child, but it is, it's just a moment, you know, in the craziness of, of our days and our lives where you have that connection with your Mm. child. I love that you just brought this up because I'll share this moment with you. I'd actually just told my mom that this happened. So I, by nature, am a morning person. Uh, By nighttime, I'm I'm toast. I'm that person I could go to bed at eight o'clock and be very content with life, right? So having two young kids, my brain is fried at night. And with my youngest, I was very diligent with bedtime stories or my oldest. I'm sorry. I was very diligent with bedtime stories. As time has gone on and I wake up a little bit earlier, you know, those bedtime stories, I realized I stopped showing up. And for my youngest daughter, my oldest is now 11. So she's, she's reading by herself fully. And my youngest is almost seven. So I realized that, and it didn't feel good to me, right? Like I realized as a parent where I wasn't showing up and also I know how important it is one for the connection, but two, just to nurture the reading and she's learning how to read. So she is also an early riser by nature, and she's also toast at bedtime and doesn't give her full attention. So in the past week, what I've tried is she had started this new book series. Uh, It's a total of three books. And before school, we now read a chapter together. And I had never thought about switching my routine from bedtime stories to morning stories together because traditionally we're told, right? Bedtime stories. It's always a bedtime story, but I realized that wasn't working in our life. So in the past, I think we're on day nine now of doing it in the morning. And she is joyfully, I mean, joyfully every morning, like, mom, we have to read the book now. And she's more excited about reading than I have seen her in her entire six years of life about reading. That's great. Right. And it's just, it's one of those things too, right? We go back to giving ourselves permission and giving ourselves grace and overstepping that perfectionism because the perfect mom, right? The perfect mom does bedtime stories. The perfect mom always has it together, right? Like the perfect mom is not asleep or toast by eight o'clock at night. So we put the perfectionism aside and we just look at the realness what works for my family right now and how can I still show up while shifting the schedule a little bit. So while it may not be what every other family does, I'm learning that it works for us right now and in in this season of life, because of course we know every season looks a little bit different. It changes a little bit. And I had to give myself grace to just be okay with it. And then now after being on day nine or 10, whatever day we're on at this point, she and seeing that excitement come back into her 
it, it gave me a breath of fresh air. So you're totally right. Like it is that little bit of selfish, like I'm holding on to these memories too, and those little snuggles in the morning of reading that book together. But I love that you had really put it as a, um, a love language almost like books are a love language and sharing that with your kids really is as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's brilliant. The solution you came up with, it doesn't matter what time it is. Right. <laughs> Yeah. The stories we tell ourselves. Yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's a book. <laughs> no, there we go. Yes. I'm going to claim it. That's my next book. The stories we tell ourselves. <laughs> uh, I'll read it. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, you might publish it, Emily. You I'll never publish know. <laughs> it. <laughs> right. Oh my goodness. Well, I know we probably have so many listening right now who are already thinking about their first book or maybe even their next book. So where can our audience go to learn more about Bold Story Press and to connect with you further? Well, thank you for asking that. Um, my website is, is boldstorypress.com. And on social media, we are at Bold Story Press on Twitter and uh, Instagram, and then um, Bold Story Press on Facebook and, and LinkedIn. You can reach me at emily at boldstorypress.com and I would love to talk to you. If you are in the process of writing and, and trying to figure out the publishing solution, or if you are just getting started, reach out to me and, and let's have a conversation. I also offer free publishing webinar, webinar every month. Um, it's on the third Wednesday of every month. And um, you can find out more about that on our website too. So that's a way to find out what the different types of publishing are that are available to you and, and how you might navigate this, this process. Oh, wonderful. I will be sure to link that in this week's episode notes. Emily, you have taught me so much today about the world of publishing, but also I truly love how you are empowering women in this world. I know this information is going to serve our audience as well. Thank you so much for joining me today and sharing your light and wisdom. Oh, thank you, Lauren. I really enjoyed it. I truly love the mission that Emily is on. Be sure to connect with her further. I've linked her website and social channels on this week's episode notes found on mindbizlife.com. If you enjoyed today's episode, share it with a friend and be sure to give the podcast a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever it is that you tune in and turn it up. I'm back on Friday for another episode of Fuel Your Life Friday, but until then, remember, every level of life is an opportunity to grow. Be well, my friend.